Master of the Blade The next day was easier on both of them. Aragon felt better and was able to answer more of Brahm's questions correctly. After an especially difficult exercise, Aragon mentioned his scrying of the woman. Brahm pulled on his beard. You say she was imprisoned? Yes. Did you see her face? Asked Brahm intently. Not very clearly. The lighting was bad, yet I could tell that she was beautiful. It's strange. I don't didn't have any problems seeing her eyes, and she did look at me. Brahm shook his head. As far as I know, it's impossible for anyone to know they're being scried upon. Do you know who she might be? Asked Aragon, surprised by the eagerness in his own voice. Not really, admitted Aragon. If pressed, I suppose I could come up with a few guesses, but none of them would be very likely. This dream of yours is peculiar. Somehow you managed to scry in your sleep. Something that you'd never seen before, without saying the words of power. Dreams do occasionally touch the spirit realm, but this is different. Perhaps, to understand, we should search every prison and dungeon until we find the woman, bantered Aragon. He actually thought it was a good idea. Brom left and rode on. Brom's strict training filled nearly every hour as the days slowly blurred into weeks. Because of his splint, Aragon was forced to use his left hand whenever they sparred. Before long, he could duel as well with his left hand as he had with his right. By the time they crossed the spine and came to the plains, spring had crept over Alagazia, summoning a multitude of flowers. The bare Deciduous trees were russet with buds, while new blades of grass began to push up between last year's dead stalks. Birds returned from their winter absence to mate and build nests. The travelers followed the Toric River southeast along the edge of the spine. It grew steadily as tributaries flowed into it from every side, feeding its bulging girth. When the river was over a league wide, Brom pointed at the silt islands that dotted the water. We're close to Leona Lake now, he said. It's only about two leagues away. Do you think we can get there before nightfall? Asked Aragon. We can try. Dusk soon made the trail hard to follow, but the sound of the river at their side guided them. When the moon rose, the bright disk provided enough light to see what lay ahead. Leona Lake looked like a thin sheet of silver beaten over the land. The water was so calm and smooth that it did not even seem to be liquid. Aside from a bright strip of moonlight reflecting off the surface, it was indistinguishable from the ground. Sephira was on the rocky shore, fanning her wings to dry them. Aragon greeted her, and she said, The water is lovely, deep, cool, and clear. Maybe I'll go swimming tomorrow. He responded. They set up camp under a, tr set a stand of trees and were soon asleep. At dawn, Aragon eagerly rushed out to see the lake in daylight. A white-capped expanse of water rippled in with fan-shaped patterns where the wind brushed it. The pure size of it delighted him. He whooped and ran to the water. Sephira, where are you? Let's have some fun. The moment Aragon climbed onto her, she jumped out over the water. They soared upward, circling over the lake, but even at that height, the opposing shore was not visible. Would you like to take a bath? Aragon ca casually asked Sephira. She grinned wolfishly. Hold on. She locked her wings and sank to the waves, clipping the crests with her claws. The water sparkled in the sunlight as she sailed o as they sailed over it. Aragon whooped again. Then Sephira folded her wings and dived into the lake, her head and neck entering it like a lance. The water hit Aragon like an icy wall, knocking out his breath and almost tearing him off Sephira. He held on tightly as she swam to the surface. With three strokes of her feet, she breached and sent a burst of shimmering water into the sky. Aragon gasped and shook his hair as Sephira slithered across the lake, using her tail as a rudder. Ready? Aragon nodded and took a deep breath, tightening his arms. This time they slid gently under the water. They could see for yards. 
through the unclouded liquid. Sephira twisted and turned in fantastic shapes, slipping through the water like an eel. Aragon felt as if he were riding a sea serpent of legend. Just as his lungs started to cry for air, Sephira arched her back and pointed her head upward. An explosion of droplets haloed them as she leapt into the air, wings snapping open. With two powerful flaps, she gained altitude. Wow, that was fantastic, exclaimed Aragon. Yes, said Sephira happily, though it's a pity you can't hold your breath longer. Nothing I can do about that, he said, pressing water out of his air. His clothes were drenched and the wind from Sephira's wings chilled him. He pulled at his splint, his wrist itched. Once Aragon was dry, he and Brom saddled the horses and started around Leona Lake in high spirits while Sephira playfully dived in and out of the water. Before dinner, Aragon blocked Zarok's edge in preparation for their usual sparring. Neither he nor Brom moved as they waited for the other to strike first. Aragon inspected their surroundings for anything that might give him, give him an advantage. A stick near the fire caught his attention. Aragon swooped down, grabbed the stick, and hurled it at Brom. The splint got in his way, though, and Brom easily sidestepped the piece of wood. The old man rushed forward, swinging his sword. Aragon ducked just as the blade whistled over his head. He growled and tackled Brom ferociously. They pitched to the ground, each struggling to stay on top. Aragon rolled to the side and swept Zarok over the ground at Brom's shins. Brom parried the blow with the hilt of his sword, then jumped to his feet, twisting as he stood. Aragon attacked again, guiding Zarok through a complex pattern. Sparks danced from their blades as they struck again and again. Brom blocked each blow, his face tight with concentration, but Aragon could tell that he was tiring. The relentless hammering continued as each sought an opening in the other's defenses. Then Aragon felt the battle change. Blow by blow, he gained advantage. Brom's parries slowed as, and he lost ground. Aragon easily blocked a stab from Brom. Veins pulsed on the old man's forehead and cord, and cords bulged, and cords bulged in his neck from the effort. Suddenly confident, Aragon swung Zarok faster than ever, weaving, weaving a web of steel around Brom's sword. With a burst of sp speed, he flashed the s wow. He smashed the flat of his blade against Brom's guard and knocked the sword to the ground. Before Brom could react, Aragon flicked Zarok up to his throat. They stood panting, the red sword tip pressing on Brom's collarbone. Aragon slowly lowered his arm and backed away. It was the first time he had bested Brom without resorting to trickery. Brom picked up his sword and sheathed it. Still breathing hard, he said, We're done for today. But we've just started, said Aragon, startled. Brom shook his head. I can teach you nothing more of the sword. Of the fighters I've met, only three of them could have defeated me like that and I doubt any of them could have done it with their left hand. He smiled ruefully. I may not be as young as I used to be, but I can tell you're talented and a rare swordsman. Does that mean we're not going to spar every night? asked Aragon. Oh, you're not getting out of it, laughed Brom. But we'll go easier now. It's not important if we miss a night. It's not as important if we miss a night here or there. He wiped off his brow. Just remember, if you have the misfortune to fight an elf, trained or not, female or male, expect to lose. They, along with dragons and other creatures of magic, are many times stronger than nature intended. Even the weakest elf could easily overpower you. The same goes for the Razak. They are not human and tire much more slowly than we do. Is there any way to become their equal? asked Aragon. He sat cross-legged by Saphira. You fought well, she said. He smiled. Brom seated himself with a shrug. There are a few, but none are available to you now. Magic will let you defeat all but the strongest enemies. For those, you'll need Sephira's help, plus a great deal of luck. Remember, when creatures of magic actually use magic, they can accomplish things that could kill a human, because of their enhanced abilities. 
How do you fight with magic? Asked Aragon. What do you mean? Well, he said, leaning on an elbow, suppose I was attacked by a shade. How could I block his magic? Most spells take place instantly, which makes it possible impossible to react in time, and even if I could, how would I nullify an enemy's magic? It seems I would have to know my opponent's intention before he acted. He paused. I just don't see how it can be done. Whoever attacked first would win. Brom sighed. What you are talking about is a wizard's duel, if you will. It's extremely dangerous. Haven't you ever wondered how Galbatorix was able to defeat all of the riders without help? With the help of only a dozen or so traitors? I never thought about it, acknowledged Aragon. There are several ways, some you'll learn about later, but the main one is that Galbatorix was and still is a master of breaking into people's minds. You see, in a wizard's duel, there are strict rules that each side much must observe or else both contestants will die. To begin with, no one uses magic until one of the participants gains access to the other's mind. Saphira curled her tail comfortably around Aragon and asked, Why wait? By the time an enemy realizes that you've attacked, it will be too late for them to act. Aragon repeated the question out loud. Brom shook his head. No, it wouldn't. If I were to suddenly use my power against you, Aragon, you would surely die, but in the brief moment before you were destroyed, there would be a time for there would be time for a counterattack. Therefore, unless one combatant has a death wish, neither side attacks until one of them has breached the other's defenses. Then what happens? Aragon inquired. Brom shrugged and said, Once you're inside of your enemy's mind, it's easy enough to anticipate what he will do and prevent it. Even with that advantage, it's still possible to lose if you don't know how to counteract spells. He filled and lit his pipe. And that requires extraordinarily quick thinking. Before you can defend yourself, you have to understand the exact nature of the forces directed at you. If you're being attacked with heat, you would have to know whether it is being conveyed to you through the air, fire, light, or some other medium. Only once that's known can you combat the magic by, for instance, chilling the heated material. That sounds difficult. Extremely, confirmed Brom. A plume of smoke rose from his pipe. Seldom can people survive such a duel for more than a few seconds. The enormous amount of effort and skill required condemns anyone without the pop proper training to a quick death. Once you've progressed, I'll start teaching you the necessary methods. In the meantime, if you find yourself facing a wizard's duel, I suggest you run away as fast as you can. <laughs>